One of the crowning achievements in 2023 for Wizards of the Coast was their release of Baldur's Gate 3, a long-awaited sequel to the much-beloved Baldur's Gate series. Baldur's Gate 1 came out in the year 1998, followed quickly in 2000 by Baldur's Gate 2. Fans have been waiting for a sequel for 20 years. A lot has changed for the D&D world since 2000. That's when Dungeons & Dragons version 3 was around. It quickly became beloved and ported over to the Pathfinder system. In 2014, we got our first glimpse at Dungeons & Dragons 5e, which is the current standard. The real question is, is Baldur's Gate version 3 actually Dungeons & Dragons? I say no, and here's why. Overall, Baldur's Gate 3 does a pretty good job transporting the user into a Dungeons & Dragons game. Most people who play Dungeons & Dragons will be very familiar with Baldur's Gate 3 and the mechanics that they're mostly aping in order to play the game. And it is pretty similar, but there are some significant differences. First of all, there's a number of changes which are really based on the developer Lariant using its Divinity 4.0 game engine. This means, this means they took Dungeons and Dragons 5e and crammed it into this game engine. So the first thing is single use of certain items. For example, lockpicks. In D&D 5e, you don't even technically need a lockpick to try to pick a lock, but in this game you do. And for some reason, lockpicks can only be used one time, as if they're some sort of plastic spark that will assuredly break when you pop a lock. The second is strange mechanics around throwing potions on the ground to affect more than one player. Now, I'm not quite sure why this would be. Usually in 5e, it's just a bonus action to consume a potion or perhaps to shove one into someone else's mouth if they're already down. But in this game, you can throw one on the ground, which I guess is absorbed by the skin through the soles of their shoes or something. I'm not really sure how that works, but it's a game mechanic and it's fun. You also have strange changes to movement. For example, jumping is often a bonus action, whereas in 5e, jumping is part of your movement. Uh, the three main actions in combat in Dungeons & Dragons 5e is you have an action, a bonus action, and your movement, which are three separate, and of course a reaction. You also have infinite equipable magic items. In Dungeons and Dragons 5e, many if not most of the magic items, especially the more rare items that you would certainly want to use, are require attunement. Attunement means you have to meditate on the object for an hour and it sort of becomes one with you. Most classes are only allowed to have three attunable items at one time, so it really makes the player think and have to choose which ones would benefit their character the most. In Baldur's Gate 3, you can just have as many as you like for whatever reason. And this also leads to the lack of a certain class, the Artificer class. Now, this wasn't a class that originally appeared in the Dungeons & Dragons 5e handbook. However, it's been around since around 2017-2018. So right now we're four to five years past when this character has been there. In addition, in the character creation, we're missing a lot of the subclasses that we've come to know and love. Only certain ones, generally three per class type, have been picked. There's also a severe lack of character type choice. Now I know this is going to seem a little strange to include. You do have most of the usual ones. You have humans, gnomes, halflings, dwarves, elves, and githyanki, as well as the dragonborn. But many of the other subclasses that players have come to expect over the year are just not included. There's no Aroka, there's no Tabashi. All the furries will not get their choice. The second way that Baldur's Gate 3 is not Dungeons & Dragons is the lack of freedom and railroading. Now this is a constantly debated topic in tabletop role-playing games is how much sandbox do you have versus how much railroading. The problem with a game like this is even though you do have a very wide variety of options and various styles of gameplay which will reduce different results, it's not truly free. There are only so many paths that you can choose 
There's only so many options that you can have. Even in this game, we can see bugs occur when there are some occasions that people, for example, kill an NPC that they might need to talk to later. And we can also see this in the character play style and ability to make modifications. So normally you would have a DM and a player could talk to that DM and say, hey, you know, I want to flavor my character this way. Instead of getting a spell like Fireball, you could ask the DM, hey, could I have Lightning Bolt instead? And normally a DM would be willing to make a swap based on certain reasonable requests. But in a game like this, you just don't have that option. What if players say, you know what, screw this, we don't want to go to Baldur's Gate. Maybe there's something else we got to do first. Maybe you need to go to Waterdeep and talk to Gale's guy. In a normal campaign, you could make that decision. Unfortunately, in this game, you're kind of stuck doing what they want or else. It's a good thing it's fun. The third way you can tell Baldur's Gate 3 is not real D&D is the lack of human interaction. Okay, yes, there is a cooperative play mode and it is pretty cool. You could have someone join you for a little bit or for a longer period of time or you could just make it a regular Saturday night thing where you get a group of four people together and you play. But this is kind of the problem. First of all, you're missing a DM. The DM's job is to judge players' interest in the story, to officiate what's going on between the players and to try to bring people into this world and frankly have some fun you just don't get that with having multiplayers you get all the headaches of real life of trying to schedule four people or up to four people we should say together in order to play the game but you don't get the camaraderie. You don't get the story about like, oh, you won't believe this crazy thing my sister did, or man, I had such a rough week at school or work or whatever. All that kind of stuff is missing. And the snacks, nobody's bringing chips to Baldur's Gate 3. One of the greatest things that most D&D players will tell you is that they've made some of the best friends of their life playing this game. And that's just something you're not gonna get for Baldur's Gate 3. So is Baldur's Gate 3 a fun game? Oh, heck yeah. I can't wait to see if they come out with a fourth. It's something that I think has pretty good replayability, at least for a few times, and it's not as repetitive as a open world game like World of Warcraft. So for me, it's a big win. But is it Dungeons & Dragons? No. It's got different mechanics, a lack of freedom, and a lack of human interaction. While it's a fantastic video game, it's just not a real tabletop role-playing game. Thanks for watching. If you're still here, click the subscribe button to see more videos coming soon. Give it a like, or heck, if you didn't like it, give it a don't like. And keep your eye out for Empire of the Undying Sun. That's my D&D 5e campaign horror to the max.